Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sanibel Public Library. My name is Dwayne Schaefer. I'm head of collection development for the library and your host for these ongoing World War II programs. I'm so glad you could join us today. We're going to be shifting gears going from Europe uh, out to the Pacific. Uh, but before we get into the program, I just want to touch on a couple things. Um, a program note on March 11th, we will be doing uh, virtually again, we will be doing um, the Operation Griffin, which was the operation where the Germans uh, put some of their soldiers into American uniforms uh, who were also English speaking, and they sent them behind the American lines during the Battle of the Bulge to sow uh, chaos and confusion. And on April 1st, we will finish our season with the program we should have done in January, and that is the program Big Week. And uh, it's not going to be an April Fool's joke, I promise we will be doing that. And again, it will be virtual. So uh, we have our World War II display up still until Monday. It's in the east side of the library, and it contains uh, a lot of uh, models, tanks, uh, planes, and different types of weapons. Any of you who don't have a library card yet, please come down. We are open. Uh, if you do not have a library card yet, we can get you signed up uh, because I know you probably want to read some of those books on World War II. And when you come to the library for that purpose, you're going to go all the way to the back of the library where you will go into section 940.54. That is World War II. And as always, even though we're not in person, we will be doing a pop quiz. And again, now it's going to be on the honor system. So you can play along at home. And if you get the uh, question right, then please come down to the library. I'll be happy to give you a free book, I promise. So uh, I want Danny to stand up for a second. He's the guy who makes all this possible. There he is. Say hi, Danny. And I would like to then go ahead and get everything started. Okay, we're going to be doing the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And in a lot of histories, this is uh, overlooked. And it is overlooked basically because it's known by uh, a much more uh, common name. It's called uh, the Great Mariana's Turkey Shoot. Now, we're going to put everything into perspective. Now, what we're going to do, we're probably going to spend a few more minutes on the top part of the program. We're going to get in depth to that because it's really important for you to get the gist of what's going to go on during the battle. So going up to June 1944, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the, the subject, we're going to do a quick general review. In 1942 in April, we had the Doolittle Raid where uh, Jimmy Doolittle took his B-25s over Tokyo and bombed uh, Tokyo and a couple other cities. Uh, in uh, May, we had the Battle of Coral Sea, where we lost uh, the Lexington. It, uh, of course, the Battle of Midway in June 1942 uh, was an extremely serious defeat for the Japanese Navy. They lost four of their fleet carriers. In August, we landed in Guadalcanal. Then we move up to 1943, a program that we did last year, uh, Admiral Yamamoto, who was shot down over Bougainville. In November, we had the very, very serious and bloody battle of Tarawa. Now we're going to come into 1944, uh, where various uh, actions occurred. And I put a couple of these names that you're looking at on your screen, I put them in red because they're very important. They're going to play into our current subject for today. In January, uh, the US troops invade Kwajalein. In February, they capture Kwajalein and uh, the Major Atolls in the Marshall Islands. The U.S. carrier-based planes in February also destroyed the naval base at Truk, a very huge uh, naval base that the Japanese had. And also in February, Rabaul. These three that I have highlighted in red are going to be taken over by United States forces, and we will be moving our airplanes into there. In February 23rd, the uh, U.S. carrier planes, they start their first attacks on the Mariana Islands. 
In February, Merrill, Merrill's Marauders began a ground campaign at Burma. And in April, the Japanese begin their last offensive in China. And also in April, uh, there is action in Hollandia and New Guinea. And the Allies invade Biak Island in uh, also in New Guinea. Now that's more in the southern uh, portion. We're going to be dealing with the Central Pacific. And uh, here is your uh, orientation map. Uh, the last great carrier battle of the war is going to occur uh, in June. Now I know you're also thinking about Leyte Gulf, but we will get back uh, with that. Uh, in June 1944, the Japanese had been holding back their carriers because they had suffered such incredible losses at the Battle of Midway, uh, also during the Sa uh, Solomon campaign and at Santa Cruz. The Japanese naval staff still, from the beginning of the war almost all the way till the end, were looking for this decisive battle, one battle that would knock the United States Navy uh, out of the war and make us uh, sue for peace. Uh, it was supposed, to, it would be the fifth such encounter of the war, and it was designed to be decisive. Of course, it would be decisive in a way that the Japanese would not be very happy about. Uh, for the U.S. taking and holding Saipan in the Marianas, as you can see on your map there, it's sort of right to the right-hand side in the right center. Holding that island and those island chain were going to be very critical to the Central Pacific plan. Also, that area there in the Marianas, that is the outer rim of the Japanese area of influence. Now, why do we have the uh, barrel of oil there on the bottom of the screen? Well, I know we keep seeing that barrel of oil in a lot of our presentations, and it is very important because the Japanese, of course, being an island nation, they had to import everything uh, and when they uh, started their campaigns in the Pacific, they were after those areas in the Dutch East Indies, uh, where a lot of the oil reserves uh, were kept. Now, what happens in 1944, of course, they're starting to run short on their oil. And they uh, had to have oil that would be refined because uh, untreated crude oil put into the bunkers of many of the ships would cause a lot of the engines to seize up. But at this point, they were desperate. So a lot of that oil that was coming from uh, the New Guinea area uh, down in the Celebes, they decided that they're going to go for broke and they're going to just pump that oil uh, unrefined into uh, the, their ships. Okay, first thing we're going to do, we're going to look at the commanders. And we're going to, ling again, I said, we're going to linger a little bit on some of these earlier slides, and then I promise we'll go a little faster with some of the others. The commanders, uh, very important uh, people in this uh, campaign, uh, Admiral Raymond A. Spruance. Now, I don't know how much of you have read about this, but of course, uh, he was in charge of the carriers at Midway, where a great victory was uh, achieved. However, as you also may remember, Admiral Halsey recommended him uh, because they had a lot of history together. Of course, a very interesting contrast of the two personalities. Spruance uh, in the um, academy, he was very quiet, very introverted, very bookish, always kept to himself. Halsey, of course, as you can probably understand, was the party animal. He was always the extrovert. He was always out uh, mixing things up. Um, and uh, they do have some very interesting personal history. Uh, they became very, very close to friends despite all of this. And uh, I believe it was Spruance's son who married Halsey's daughter. And there was one occasion when they were both still skippers of destroyers that they ran into each other, but uh, neither one uh, held the other one uh, to blame. Uh, Spruance, of course, he belonged to what the Navy called the gun club. And this is the... Uh, area where they thought that, of course, battleships were going to be key in uh, the next war. And there was always a uh, um, conflict between the gun club and the aviators. Halsey, of course, being very much uh, in the later camp, uh, uh, being uh, feeling that the carriers were going to be the most important. Now you see uh, Chester Nimitz on the right-hand side. 
he believed in his line officers and did not try to second guess them. In other words, he would give the orders and he would let them do their jobs. Now, something very interesting that took place is that Nimitz, uh, after Midway, uh, because Halsey and Spruance were two very, very important uh, admirals in the fleet, he would rotate their command of the of the third of the fifth fleet and it was in june that it was spruance's turn to be in command uh, here are a couple of very very important people that we're going to be talking about mark mincher who was uh, admiral who would be in charge of task force 58 we're going to learn more about task force 58 in a second uh, here in the, the bottom part, you see uh, Admiral Mitchell aboard his flagship, the Lexington, in 1944. And you're saying, well, how can that possibly be? The Lexington was sunk at Coral Sea. Well, this is the new Lexington that was built uh, after that. Facing the rear. Now, why did I put facing the rear? Well, Mitchell was very, very much the, uh, the carrier airman. He believed in air power. Uh, he believed in Navy air power, and he would always be seen sitting, looking to the rear of the, uh, the carrier or wherever the planes were taking off. He could always be seen uh, almost wishing each plane that would go into the air, you know, pushing them up into the air. And uh, our Sanibel resident that we'll touch on just briefly, Ed Sieber, who recently passed away, um, Mark Mitcher was his commander uh, during uh, the time when they attacked the Yamato. He said you could not have, like, have known a better, more likable person than, uh, than Admiral Mitcher. And here's Mitcher on the right-hand side speaking with his air group commander, Dave McCampbell, uh, the task force leading pilot. We'll talk a little bit more about him later. Uh, here's an interesting picture I thought you would like to see all of them together. Uh, we have Spruance, Mitcher, Nimitz, and uh, Admiral Willis Lee. Willis Lee will be in charge of the battleships uh, that will be with uh, Task Force 58. Of course, as I said, Mitcher was in command of that task force. Spruance in overall command of the landings at Saipan, which we will show why that was important. He was in charge of the landings at Saipan and the Navy assets that would be accompanying them. Now we're going to get to the Japanese commanders. This is all very, very important too. Again, we, we mentioned that the Japanese Navy was always all about the decisive battle. They wanted to go out there and have one big powerful stroke that would knock the United States Navy out. Uh, Admiral Ozawa, uh, he was the last commander in chief of the combined fleet. Uh, his flagship is the fleet carrier Teho. Uh, and the powerful fleet carrier Shikaku and Suikaku were also under his command. Those two last carriers uh, were at, present at Pearl Harbor, uh, also at, um, at the Aleutians during the Midway campaign. Underneath, we have Admiral Kakuda, and he was going to be in charge of the land-based air force in the Marianas, on Guam and some of the other islands. The Japanese plan, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, was very, very reliant upon the land-based air force being very strong and being very powerful. Uh, unfortunately, the amount of planes that finally made it there, uh, he had about 172, the naval plan called for 540. And after the US preliminary raids, which pl took place in mid-June, he would be left with only 50 aircraft. On the right, we have Vice Admiral Kurita. He was in charge of the Sea Force, uh, which would contain the aircraft carriers Chitosa, Chikyota, and uh, Zuiho. Those were not huge fleet carriers. Those were more um, auxiliary carriers. They were light carriers that had been converted from some marine tenders. They would usually carry a complement of about 30 uh, aircraft. Again, on the bottom, don't let this get very far out of your mind we must have a decisive battle, and that's going to keep uh, entering into our talk. Here's uh, some of the fleet weapons, the fleets and the weapons that were uh, present, as you see, very, very heavy on the US side. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. Uh, this is gonna be a very, very one-sided battle, and I'll tell you why uh, as we go along. Again, you're looking at some of the names on there, and you're saying, well, how could possibly, how could the Langley uh, be there? How could the Yorktown be there? Well, again, 
Yorktown was sunk at uh, Midway, but then again, they built a new one as they did uh, with the Lexington and the Wasp. Well, we'll talk about uh, some of those carriers later. I uh, indicated the three fleet carriers of the Japanese that you see those first three names. The rest of them were uh, medium range or light carriers. Uh, and this is going to be the largest carrier battle uh, that ever took place and hopefully will ever take place. Uh, 20, uh, 24 carriers in all took part in this battle. Here's a breakdown of those carriers. We see the uh, Japanese fleet in the middle and we see the United States fleet on the right. A uh, huge number of assets that they're all going to be uh, bringing into the fight. Uh, you will see uh, submarines too, very important. We'll talk about why those were important later. It should take a second to digest all of that. And the converted carriers, those are the ones I mentioned uh, that the Japanese had. Battleships, again, both sides, some of the admirals on both sides were hoping to bring those battleships in so uh, they could refight the Battle of Jutland or Dogger Bank. Uh, is still, uh, we'll see how that all works out. Here's uh, the Teho, the Japanese carrier. Uh, it had very heavy belt armor and for the first time an armored flight deck. If you remember the movie Midway, if you remember anything about Midway, those bombs come flying straight down and going straight through the flight deck. Uh, these uh, armored decks were designed to help prevent that. However, the Teho is going to meet a very uh, different uh, fate uh, it is going to be uh, eventually torpedoed by the USS Albacore. It was designed to carry 65 planes, uh, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Zeros, Judys, and Valves. Uh, unfortunately, 1,650 officers and men out of the complement of over 2,000 would be killed when she sank. Here's one of our carriers, the Essex class, uh, the flagship, the name Essex. Uh, it carried 90 uh, aircraft fighters, torpedo planes, and bombers. Uh, the Avenger, which took over for the uh, Devastator, which did so, so poorly at uh, Midway. The Hellcat, we'll talk more about that. And uh, at the, towards the end of the Pacific War, the, the Corsair uh, was uh, also a fighter on, on the aircraft carriers. Here's the other uh, Japanese uh, aircraft carrier, the Shukaku. It was the lead ship of her class. Uh, it, it was present, as I said, at Pearl Harbor, the Coral Sea in Santa Cruz. Uh, it is going to be torpedoed and sunk by a United States submarine during the battle. Uh, again, 1,272 men were killed when it went down. Here is uh, the new Lexington. And uh, it was, uh, again, the second uh, of its name played a major role in the uh, victory uh, of the uh, Philippine Sea. With over 300 enemy aircraft, uh, it would help destroy in one day. We'll talk about that. We'll go a little quicker on some of those slides. Uh, here is uh, the Monterey. And I put a couple of extra things on this slide so you could take a look. The uh, Orlac and 20 millimeter cannon, which you see. And on the right hand bottom side, you see the proximity fuse. And that was something that had just been developed. And what the proximity fuse shell is that it would shoot out and it would be timed to explode, not into a target, but near enough to a target that within 50 yards, it would explode and hit everything in that area. Very, very deadly, very, very effective. Here is the Mitsubishi Zero. This is probably one of the best known aircraft of the Second World War. However, it did have some flaws. Uh, it uh, was very light and very nimble. Uh, however, it was very, had very poor armor protection uh, for the pilot. Plus it did not have self-sealing gas tanks, so it became very easy to shoot them down. Again, very, very maneuverable. We didn't know what to do with this airplane for the first few years of the war. Uh, the Wildcat would be replaced by the Hellcat, and uh, the Hellcat would be a much heavier, much better armed uh, airplane and be able to deal with uh, the Zero. The Zero had two 20 millimeter cannon in the wings and two 7.7 .7 millimeter machine guns in the nose. 
Here's the Hellcat that we talked about. Uh, it, as I said, bigger and heavier. It's got that big uh, Pratt & Whitney engine in there for a top speed of 375 miles per hour. It can more than keep up uh, with the uh, Japanese Zero. Again, the tactics for the Hellcat was to stand off and hopefully gain height over uh, the opponent and dive on them and use those uh, deadly 50 caliber machine guns uh, to very good effect. Here is uh, one of the Japanese uh, dive bombers, uh, the Val, the Achi D3A. It had 7.7 uh, millimeter machine guns uh, and it had uh, one in the rear for the observer. The bomb load was one uh, 250 kilogram bomb and was released much the same way as the bomb on the Dauntless would be released on a trapeze that would swing out and underneath to uh, release the bomb. You're going to notice that a lot of these planes on the American side, you're going to see improvements. You're going to see new variants. You're going to see new aircraft. On the Japanese side, not so much uh, because many of the planes that took place at Coral Sea and took place at Midway, you're also going to see at this battle as well. But then you will also see a few new ones. Here's the new dive bomber. I'm sorry, the new torpedo plane, the Grumman Avenger. It's a, a three-seat monoplane. It replaced the Devastator. Uh, it could be used both as a, a dive bomber or a torpedo bomber, and it had an enclosed bomb bay. It also had a dorsal turret uh, on the back. It had a ventral turret, which came as a surprise to a lot of Japanese pilots when they were trying to get into a kill position underneath the plane. Here is the Mitsubishi G4M, otherwise known as the Betty. Uh, we have seen this before. Uh, this is the plane that Admiral Yamamoto was shot down in. And you're probably saying, well, what does this have to do with carriers? This was not a plane that would have been on any of the Japanese carriers. This is a bomber that was on some of the land-based airstrips uh, in the Marianas, such as Guam, Tinian, and Saipan. Uh, however, the, the Mitsubishi would serve uh, all the way to the end of the war. Here's the Douglas Dauntless. This is actually the workhorse of the uh, American naval fleet. Uh, it served all the way through the war, even though it was uh, slightly uh, obsolete by the time this battle rolls around. Uh, the Avenger and the Hell Diver are, are eventually going to replace it but it was a much easier plane to fly than either the Hell Diver or the Avenger. Uh, but again, it has the bomb release on the trapeze, which goes down and underneath and drops the bomb, uh, as you can see, down in the right-hand corner. Here is, uh, unfortunately, this is a really, really fine airplane, the Nakajima Jill, and it is just starting to come online during this battle. But because of the nature of this battle, it would fail to inflict any damages on uh, the, uh, the American fleet. had a very powerful engine, and it also could carry either bombs or torpedoes. But we will see these, we will encounter these during the battle that's coming up. Here's a, a couple uh, float planes here. Now, the difference between a float plane, float plane and a flying boat is that the pontoon is underneath like that separate from the aircraft itself where the whole aircraft like a PBY or a Kawanishi Emily, they sit in the water actually. Uh, again, the Japanese are gonna take tremendous casualties uh, in their float planes as well. Uh, the Kingfisher, uh, the Vought Kingfisher on the right, that was our float plane that we flew from our uh, ships and it was used uh, for reconnaissance and bombing. Here's the Hell Diver, uh, the SB2C Hell Diver. Uh, this is the plane that is going to replace uh, eventually the Dauntless. Uh, it could carry a torpedo or a bomb. And we mentioned earlier Ed Sieber, the Sanibel resident that helped uh, destroy, helped uh, sink the Yamato. Uh, this was his type of plane. And he told me several stories about how difficult this plane was to fly until you could really, really get used to it. Uh, the, the interesting thing at this time, uh, when it started coming into uh, action and uh, later on 
an action against the Amato. They finally had some primitive G suits, which would help uh, when they were diving straight down. And Ed was always careful to tell me that they never dove at a 45 degree angle. They would dive straight down at a 90 degree angle. And uh, if you permit me uh, a little bit of crudity here, he also told me that the SB2C standard for son of a bitch second class, but we won't dwell on that. And anyway, he had a lot of stories to tell about uh, the, the hell diver. All right, here's another plane, uh, the Yucca Super Judy. Again, this is just starting to come in line. And there are some stories that uh, it was patterned after the German Henkel 118, which you see down on the right-hand side. There are some similarities, uh, but as you can see, there are some differences too. Uh, this was going to be, it had an enclosed bomb bay. It was going to be also, a, it could be either a torpedo a bomber or a dive bomber as well. Uh, here's the, um, the Kate. Uh, it is, uh, again, these are planes that were serving during Midway Coral Sea, but they're going to serve all the way up until the end of the war, and uh, they will even be used uh, during the era of the Kamikaze, which uh, will come in late 44 and early uh, 45. So what were their plans? What was the Japanese plan? What was the American plan? Well, the uh, Japanese plan, and this is interesting that it was originally called Operation Z, uh, the plans for defending the Marianas. And the Japanese had hoarded enough oil and enough supplies. This is where uh, the Waterloo was going to take place. This is where they were going to have the ultimate battle. They were going to lure the United States fleet into battle. Unfortunately, the plans fell into uh, American hands unfortunate for the Japanese. Uh, Admiral Koga, who was uh, traveling with his chief of staff, uh, Admiral Fukudome, uh, they had to ditch during a typhoon. Uh, Admiral Koga was killed. Admiral Fukudome was captured by uh, Filipino guerrillas. Eventually, because they didn't want to suffer repercussions from the Japanese, they let Fukudome go, but they kept his briefcase and they sent it down to Douglas MacArthur's headquarters and they suddenly had all the plans that the Japanese uh, intended on uh, implementing. Uh, the new CNC, Admiral Toyota, not uh, to be confused with the car, uh, it was changed from Operation Z to Operation Ago. Uh, what the plan was for the Japanese, they were going, again, they were going to uh, depend greatly on those land-based planes in the Marianne, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam they were going to rough up the American fleet whenever it was detected, uh, do them a lot of damage. Then the aircraft carriers would come in and uh, not finish the job, but soften them up a little more. And then those two big battle wagons you see on the bottom of your screen, the Yamato and the Mushashi with their huge guns would then come in and finish off any of the American ships that were left over. Well. The problem is that their plan, Operation Ago, is going to be scuttled from almost the very beginning. Not only because we had all their plans, but because the whole land base. Oh, here's our triple header. Our triple header pop quiz, Danny. You already answered some of these. All right, you're going to play at home with this, and I'm going to trust you to be honest. Okay, these three actors, they all appeared in the movie Midway. And they played Admiral Nimitz, Admiral Spruance, and Admiral Halsey. Can you name them? And I can hear the wheels turning. Everybody's thinking. Of Some people said, oh, yeah, I know them. So we won't give you any more time to think. They are Henry Fonda, Glenn Ford, and Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum playing Halsey, Henry Ford playing Nimitz, and, of course, Glenn Ford playing Admiral Spruance. So... Continuing on, this is a really, really great slide, and I want you to look at it. This is the American Task Force 58, and this is how it was laid out. You see all of those 15 carriers, and you see them facing to the east. Well, it's important that you know that they had to sail east in order to have the carriers be in the wind to be able to take off. So of course, who's going to have the advantage here? 
of course, it's going to be the Japanese that are coming in from the West because they can then just take off their planes and they could fly straight for the, uh, the task force where um, Spruance had to keep sailing towards the east, make sure he didn't get too close to the Mariana Islands, but still he had to sail east in order that his planes could uh, take off. And on the top, you see the Bella Wood, the Tad Hornet, New York town, and uh, in the middle, the Princeton Enter Enterprise, Lexington, and San Jacinto, and on the bottom, the Cabot Wasp Monterey and Bunker Hill. And you see Admiral Willis Lee's uh, battleship uh, task force in the rear. Of course, all of these have an incredible amount of protection, uh, outer ring protection, uh, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers. Sporrance's task, his orders. He was to oversee the invasion of Saipan. He was to protect that bridgehead, and he was to defeat any Japanese naval reaction. Note, he was not supposed to go out looking for the Japanese. He was supposed to stay close to uh, Saipan and protect the invasion. Sporrance's primary mission, was to protect the landings, and he would follow those orders to the letter. Unfortunately, it would also become controversial as well, which we'll talk about. Uh, here's an interesting picture. This is a Hellcat landing uh, uh, on the Lexington, and uh, torpedoes being loaded aboard the, the Avenger. You can see how that's working. You can see how their wings are folded up when they're on the deck like that, and of course, then they will be folded out uh, in preparation for takeoff. Oh, Danny, look. She did it again. I can't help it. I'm sorry. See action now. Oh, how many double entendres can you see in this poster, huh? All right, let's get rid of that. Okay, the battle. Finally, we're here. Okay, we're going to talk about the battle. On the day of the battle, June 19th, uh, the weather was clear and uh, the ceiling was almost unlimited, which we'll talk about in a second, why that became an incredible disadvantage for the Japanese. Uh, Admiral Ozawa would launch, begin launching four of his airstrikes against the Americans around uh, eight o'clock. Uh, at that time, there is, uh, what, here's uh, one of our maps we're gonna show you. There's a couple that I decided on uh, to not use because there were too many lines going all over the place. This one is pretty easy to follow. Uh, the Japanese mobile fleet on June 13th is sighted leaving Tawi Tawi, which was their anchorage. They're sighted almost instantly by the uh, submarine Redfish as they're leaving. So we are already aware that the Japanese fleet is on the move. The Japanese, they had excellent, remember I showed you the picture of their float plane, and they had excellent uh, reconnaissance. Eventually, when they would come out of San Bernardino Strait, as you can see at the top there, they knew exactly where uh, Speronis' fleet was. Our air reconnaissance in this battle, unfortunately, was not uh, as good. Uh, they were not able to uh, locate the Japanese uh, from the air but we were pretty much uh, shadowing them uh, in the water. Our radar, of course, almost from the very beginning, we had radar, and it, by the time this battle comes along, our radar is very sophisticated. So we can see those blips coming from a couple hundred miles away. The Japanese radar, um, by this time, they finally had some, but it was very, very primitive. Uh, our submarine net, was very good, as you can see uh, from the redfish sighting that uh, fleet, uh, the flying fish seeing it coming out of the uh, Bernardino Strait. The Japanese submarine marine net, they were good also, but not for this battle. So many of them were out of place. And on the bottom there, you can see the battleship uh, fleet of the Yamato and Mushashi moving up from the south again. Uh, one of our submarines is going to sight them coming in uh, around June 15th. The battle is going to begin in earnest on June 19th, and you can see them all coming together uh, as they get closer to the Marianas. Uh, here is the Bunker Hill. Uh, during the battle, uh, the, in the opening phases, the Bunker Hill was damaged. It was one of the first uh, ships that uh, 
some of the Japanese planes got through the screen in an explosion of a bomb that sh uh, threw sh uh, shrapnel fragments across the deck. A couple of sailors were killed and about 80 were wounded. Uh, the Bunker Hill is going to continue in the fight and they will end up shooting down a few of the Japanese uh, planes. Here is another uh, map. This is even more simple. Uh, this is going to show you how the battle is going to shake out in uh, the area of June 19th and, and the 20th. You see the fleets moving at Tawi Tawi and then the mobile fleet moving along there until they finally clash uh, about 90, 100 miles uh, west, I'd say, from Guam. And you see a couple little blue airplanes like that around Tinian, Rota, and uh, Guam. These are the American airstrikes on those islands uh, before the actual battle began. These are some of the planes uh, of the land-based force of the Japanese that were supposed to be so, so important in roughing up our carriers and our task forces they came in. Uh, we also had some uh, assets go up to Iwo Jima and uh, bomb those airfields. The whole key was to bomb those airfields and make them unusable so the Japanese couldn't sneak up on, uh, our, plane, on our planes and our ships. Uh, and I want to say uh, around uh, probably uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock, we had uh, Hellcats uh, over Guam uh, because they saw planes uh, on radar that were taking off from there. And that was the beginning of uh, what was going to be an incredible massacre of Japanese planes. Uh, they were flying over Guam. They were shooting down planes. Suddenly, there is this huge radar blip uh, that's coming from the west. This would be Ozawa's first and second strikes coming in. Uh, and uh, Mitcher sent out the, uh, the coded uh, message, hey, Rube. And that was the signal for all the uh, Hellcats and planes that were flying over the Marianas to return as quickly as possible to uh, the carriers because action was about to happen. Uh, here is uh, Captain uh, McCampbell. We talked about him a little earlier. Uh, on the day of the battle, uh, during uh, he would shoot down five dive bombers, and he became an ace in a day. Later that afternoon during a second sortie, he would uh, drop, uh, shoot two more uh, planes down. In total, he would claim seven on that day. Now, I know you're looking at his Hellcat up there, and you're seeing all of those Japanese flights. This is a picture of later on uh, as in several of the battles that he would participate in. Those are all victories that he would score. Okay, here's another map. Again, this is uh, getting a little more simple, as you can see. Uh, the uh, battleship force coming up under Admiral Yugaki from the south, the main mobile fleet going uh, from west to east, and uh, the general area of uh, Task Force eight, uh, 58. As you can see, again, those little blue arrows going back to uh, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, those were the very important raids that we conducted uh, on the day of the battle and before that to knock those uh, land-based planes out. Then it's going to be Carrier versus carrier. Uh, here's some. Uh, here's a uh, an Avenger flying over Chichima Island. Again, this is one of the raids uh, that was conducted. Uh, this island is up around Iwo Jima. Uh, again, they're bombing a Japanese airfield, trying to keep their assets out of the fight. Uh, here's the carriers Likaku and two destroyers that are under attack. Uh, by our aircraft, and this is going to be on June 20th. The submarines, as I indicated, uh, the Albacore, uh, it is going to end up sinking uh, Ozawa's flagship, the Tejo, and uh, the story of that is uh, Lieutenant Commander Blanchard was shadowing uh, one set of Japanese ships, but they were going too, too fast for him. And all of a sudden, he turns his periscope around and he sees the Tejo coming almost right in front of him. So he's going to fire a spread of six torpedoes. He instantly dives because the Japanese destroyers see this and they're going to start dropping uh, depth charges on him. They're underneath uh, uh, and they're listening for the explosions and they're not hearing anything. They're, they're waiting for those explosions to come. And then finally, the sixth torpedo hits uh, the Tejo. And at first, 
there is not serious damage uh, to the Tejo, and they think that they're going to be able to uh, keep this under control. However, uh, after a while, there are um, there's aviation fuel and there's bombs and there's uh, vapor that is uh, ignited and extreme explosions occur and the Tejo is going to sink. The Albacore, uh, the submarine that was built in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, by the way, uh, it was it would be sunk off of Hokkaido. Uh, a Japanese patrol boat saw the explosion and it would be lost with all 60 hands. Here is the Kabbalah, again, another American submarine that's going to be very important because it's going to sink the huge Japanese fleet carrier, the Shikaku. Uh, it, it also is going to uh, fire torpedoes. Three are going to hit the Shikaku. Uh, after several depth charging by destroyers, the Kabbalah was able to escape. And uh, again, it looked like the Shikaku was going to make it. They thought they were going to be able to bring the, all the fires under control but all of the firefighting equipment, many of the pumps and everything were breaking down. Several Japanese ships were gonna come alongside and try to fight the flames as well, but the Chicago would also sink. Uh, here is our, uh, I guess you would call it our wallpaper at the very beginning. This is Commander Charles Brewer and his uh, squadron from the USS Essex. They're gonna attack one of those waves that were coming in, those are, uh, Jills that you see with the torpedoes and zeros. They're going to claim 20 kills. And thanks to our superior radar, as I indicated, we could see those Japanese planes coming from 50, 75, 100 miles away. So we were able to vector uh, our planes into a very perfect position so they could intercept them. Uh, one of the only damages that's going to occur to uh, one of our ships is that uh, an enemy plane is going to get through uh, the destroyer screen and it's going to drop a bomb near the USS South Dakota. However, enough of the uh, shrapnel and uh, damage that occurred, 50 men would be killed. Now, here's a picture of the contrails. And I think I mentioned this earlier. Why was the contrail so important? Well, they had unlimited visibility on the day of the battle and the Japanese planes were coming from the west not only were they on the radar, the Americans could see these contrails coming in the sky. So that was almost like uh, a warning that say, here, here we're coming and you can see those uh, uh, contrails and they were able to, of course, get our planes up and into position well ahead of the time that those planes arrived and end up shooting down almost every one of them. Here's some action uh, during a debriefing this is where it comes from. One of the uh, American pilots on the Lexington said, well, hell, it was just like an old time turkey shoot down home. And the reason why is that the Japanese pilots, again, remember, this was not Midway. This was not Coral Sea. This was not Santa Cruz. By 1944 at this time, the Japanese had not used their carriers at all. And their training was rushed and many, many of these pilots were so badly trained, they didn't have enough flying time. And on the other side, our pilots had been very, very highly trained at this point. They had superior aircraft in the form of the Hellcat, as you can see there. And of course, the Zero, a wonderful plane, very nimble, but in the hands of an inexperienced pilot or a pilot with very little training, we were able to shoot them down in droves. And uh, here's a, this is kind of an unfortunate story. This is uh, Lieutenant George Brown. He, uh, uh, and this was actually um, on the 20th, this was on the, uh, the raid that was sent out uh, looking for some of the uh, Japanese uh, ships. He was from the, the Bella Wood. His Avenger is going to be hit by gunfire from the Japanese carrier Hiyo. Uh, his radio men and gunner are gonna bail out, but Brown pressed his attack. His torpedo was going, they're very sure his torpedo hit the carrier, uh, but he was wounded and uh, he is never going to make it back to the Bella Wood. However, his plane and several of the other Avengers, they were successful in hitting the EO and it was going to sink as well. Uh, here's a, a picture. This is uh, probably some of the uh, Japanese carriers, the Chokai or the Chiyoto. 
Uh, the Bunker Hill is going to dodge several bombs, but it's going to, as I indicated, it's going to kill a couple people. Um, the Bunker Hill is going to be very severely damaged in 1945 at Okinawa by kamikazes. Uh, here's a painting of uh, the Hellcat, and it is uh, attacking, looks like probably a Judy. Again, we're going to shoot down uh, a couple hundred planes. And again, it's because those Japanese pilots are so badly trained. Uh, this is uh, the next day, uh, June 20th. Spruance is finally letting Mitcher go. Mitcher is seething all through June 19th because he wants to go after the Japanese. He wants to get our planes out there. And then finally, Spruance says, okay, we're gonna go out and uh, you go ahead, Mitcher, you go ahead and send those planes out. And by this time, Ozawa had been given um, a message saying, get back because you've lost too many planes and you've lost three carriers. You will, you lost two carriers. You're gonna lose another one on that day uh, to come back. And we went finally out looking for them. And uh, what happened is the, the attack did not get underway till four or five in the afternoon. And by the time they're coming back, those pilots are running out of fuel. And Mitcher, uh, in, in violation of all safety measures, he said, I don't care if there's any submarines around. They turned on all the lights of all of the ships, all of the aircraft carriers, and all of the ships. They turned lights on, they fired flares, they had searchlights. So as many of those planes, as many of those hell divers and Avengers could get back, still we lost about 70 of our planes. Many of them had to ditch, but the good news is that uh, most of those pilots were recovered. Uh, this guy, uh, Alexander Vercu, he became an ace in one day. He shot down six planes uh, on just, on, oh, he shot down five on one mission and then another one on the next one that he came up, he was a he was an ace in one day. He would go on to uh, uh, accumulate a lot more kills, and he died in 2016 at the age of 96. Uh, this is a cool picture. This is uh, on in the flight deck of the Lexington. All those Japanese flags are airplanes that were shot down on the 19th or the 20th, as you can see, they uh, garnered quite a score. Now the picture down on the right-hand side, those are not casualties. Those are members of the flight crew and the flight deck crew uh, sleeping and taking naps between missions. And believe me, they earned their rest. Uh, well, finally, um, the remaining ships, uh, the remaining uh, carriers of the Japanese were recalled. And by this time, they were pretty much useless. It's like having a gun without ammunition or a car without gasoline. And they were going to be used to lure Admiral Halsey away from the Leyte beaches. Our losses were bad enough, but disaster would have ensued if it were not for the heroic actions of Taffy Free. And that's a whole nother story uh, about Leyte Gulf. Then the kamikazes are going to come into the picture. And that again is also another story. Well, why are there B-29s in this picture? Well, now we're going to bring it all together. We're going to tie everything together. Taking Saipan, of course, which fell about a month later, our guys finally conquered the whole island. Taking Saipan, all of those air bases that the Japanese had, and Timian, and Guam, and Saipan, they were ours now, and we were going to bring in those heavy bombers, and this was going to be bad news for the Japanese on the mainland, because that B-29 you see on your screen, that could then reach the Japanese mainland, and they would bomb them. And of course, the end of the story is it's going to be uh, the Enola Gay that's going to drop an atomic bomb on the Japanese. Okay, here's our aftermath and the cost. Well, there's a lot of information here. Uh, of course, again, as I indicated, very, very one-sided battle. Uh, we had one battleship damaged, that was the South Dakota. We had 123 aircraft destroyed all causes. 
Now we're going to break that down. The 123, the majority of those were from that second day where we lost them to ditching and uh, accidents and uh, various causes. Uh, I think in actual combat, we may have lost 30 planes. The Japanese, however, a total of 645 aircraft, 430 of those being their carrier-based planes, the rest of them being those land-based planes. Uh, they had two of their fleet carriers sunk and the one light carrier, uh, the Higo, and they had approximately 3,000 dead. And there's absolutely no uh, controversy about this. The tactical and the strategic victory go to the United States. And because of this victory in the Philippine Sea, forget about Leyte Gulf for a second. This victory at the at, uh, Philippine Sea made our victory pretty much inevitable. Again, why? Because all of those pilots were gone and the Japanese had very, very few pilots left. Now, let's talk about Admiral Spruance. He was criticized after the battle for letting the enemy go. And many of, there's many historic uh, examples of this. Uh, George Meade at Gettysburg after the third day when Lee got away. McClellan after Antietam and Lee got away. Of course, we're not gonna get into that. Uh, Mitcher, who of course, again, as I said, was the uh, carrier man all about Navy air aviation. He, he was really chomping at the bit on the 19th. He wanted to go out and go after those uh, uh, enemy carriers. He said the enemy escaped. In at Pearl Harbor at the Naval HQ, uh, there was the quote, they said, our results were disappointing. I disagree about that, uh, but there was one person uh, at the Naval HQ, a high ranking admiral who said, this is what comes from putting a destroyer captain in charge of carriers. Again, I think that was a little unfair. But what we need to look at on the whole is that at midnight, the night before this battle, Admiral Zawa had nine carriers and he had 430 Navy planes on those carriers. Only 24 hours later, he was going home, sure, with six carriers, but he only had 35 planes and 12 float planes. And all those other float planes were lost as well. Gone were over 400 of those planes and the flight crew. I'm gonna let you decide because there is pros and cons about this. Was Admiral Spruance successful? And I'm gonna let you be the judge of that. And what was the lesson about Philippine Sea that Admiral Halsey ignored? Again, were the Japanese totally defeated? No, no, they weren't. And they would slip away, but the loss in pilots were catastrophic. Now, what's gonna happen after this? Uh, Guam is gonna fall in uh, late July. Tinian is gonna fall in late July. Because of this battle, and they were able to cover this up for a long time. They were able to cover this up, the Japanese were, about how severe their losses were the inside circles of the Japanese government do. And this is one of the reasons why uh, Tojo was ousted. Then we're gonna come up to Leyte Gulf and we know pretty much what happened there. Uh, Halsey was going to be then in charge uh, of the fleet. And he, I'm sorry, and then he, unlike Spruance, that force of Japanese carriers was bait. It was bait to lure Halsey away from the landing beaches at Leyte. Did Halsey fall for it? Unfortunately, yes, he did. However, uh, there was enough of a force left behind. Tappy 3, which I mentioned, was just a handful of our ships. The Japanese come in roaring with about 25 of their surface ships and Taffy 3 fights so hard, they make the Japanese think it's a much larger force. So a disaster is then averted. Now, um, Danny, that is going to be it. So next time, um, well, wait a second. I have, um, I wanted to mention, uh, we have uh, a couple of 
books perhaps you might consider for uh, additional reading. Uh, Philippine Sea, 1944 by Mark Stilla. Sea of Thunder by Evan Thomas. The Clash of Carriers by Barrett Tillman. You may remember Barrett Tillman if you watched any of the TV series uh, Dogfights because he covered a lot of the Pacific uh, oriented programs. And finally, The Fleet at Flood Tide. This is a very, very good book. It has a lot of really great uh, anecdotal uh, stories. Uh, the Fleet and Flood Tide by James Hornfisher. And I want to thank you very much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.